Thanks for having me. Uh, I want to pre-apologize for any cough that I might be, echo might be echoing throughout. I can tell you that I have everything here. Cough syrup, herbal tea, <laughs> cough drops, sparkling water, Chinese herbal medicine, all everything that you could imagine. It still doesn't fully suppress any dry cough that anyone would have at this time. Anyway, pre-apologize for that. Thank you very much for having me here. I'd like to talk today about uh, a number of uh, 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 research that we've been conducting, our group at the MIT Media Lab, primarily focused on what I like to call beyond smart cities. And the term smart cities you may have ideas about. In fact, if you look at these commercials by IBM, there's this smarter planet where, you're, uh, where, where the idea is that we've added this sort of digital infrastructure on top of cities so that we can understand how cities operate. And this is really the approach of sort of the professional firms and IT companies that really think of the city as a sort of piece of static infrastructure that you're adding sensing capability on, that you're creating a kind of actu uh, actuated uh, sort of sense of, 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 of technology that will allow you to th control things like traffic signals, for example. But from my point of view, the control of traffic signals may begin to optimize the amount of traffic flow you may have in a city. But if you go to Beijing, where the traffic is three hours long for any commute, what level of optimization is actually going to get you? 15 minutes in a two-hour commute? So there are limits to today's sort of current smart cities approach, which is basically the optimization of cities. And of course, traffic is one thing. Crime is another. Water use is another. But at some point, you have to reinvent the entire system. And that's really what we're trying to do, is think of new systems for this. Just to give you some background, uh, this is the Media Lab, and for all the architects out there, you're probably familiar with this building. This is the Fumiko Maki building, which is the extension of the Media Lab. So I want to give you a few slides now just to show you a little bit about the background of the Media Lab, if you're not familiar with it, and where we come from, especially from a kind of pedagogical uh, point of view. This is all the list of all the research groups in the Media Lab. Now, City Science, which I helped to, uh, to run, is actually a collection of these different research groups. And what we try to do is to try to bring together multiple research groups to tackle a larger problem. In this case, the city. The city is, a very, is you know, the most complex system that you can imagine. You can see that from the list of these, comp these uh, group research groups, the areas in which research is conducted. And in fact, we also do um, um, spend a lot of our effort in uh, bringing companies into the problem as well, looking at the problem. In fact, we have many corporate sponsors. Uh, the Media Lab is probably the most successful academic industrial research program in the world in terms of raising money uh, to do research, which is generally um, uh, non-directed. So sort of money flows, and that money is sort of distributed by those groups, and they conduct their research. Of course, there's directed research on top of that, and that's what we'll show you uh, now. Just an example of some of the research that's being done, this is a lot of work on uh, ro robots and artificial intelligence by Cynthia Brazil. Brazil, she does a lot of work on gestural, facial gestures, facial gesture recognition in robots. And in fact, one of her students created a robot that helps you to lose weight. Right, she's very, very interested in how you personalize a relationship between a robot that becomes a kind of health coach. Right, so this is sort of a fusion of both uh, sort of human dynamics as well as artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't know how many people have an Amazon Kindle, but the, the display, the electronic display that's in the Kindle and many other electronic books came from the Media Lab. That's the electronic ink display. It was a very low power display, which only uses power when you switch images. This is a very low power display, and of course it's bulletproof, by the way. If you cut it with a, with a knife, it actually still works. Professor Hare is doing a lot of work on building prosthetics and exoskeletons. And <coughs> in fact, he's a double amputee himself. What he's interested in developing is smart prosthetics that not only capture energy as you're walking, but also sense the road as well. So you can imagine the entire sort of human mach uh, machine interface being one sort of smart device that's connected together. Guitar Hero, if you have any kids, or if you're a kid yourself, um, this now, of course, is just a very fancy karaoke machine, but certainly a multi-billion dollar business, right? Is to think about sort of the fusion of t 
tangible devices like this along with gaming. Right? So that came out of the Media Lab. And of course, if you, perhaps Nicholas uh, Negroponte, who you know is the founder of the lab, was most famously <coughs> uh, um, uh, 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 led the effort to develop the One Laptop Per Child project, which is this very inexpensive laptop uh, that can be deployed uh, in places where there isn't very much electricity. Uh, and certainly, these uh, uh, devices are able to connect with each other. Uh, and then Professor Oxman, who does a lot of work on 3D printing, as well as architecture and sort of structural design, bringing in biology together. She's done a lot of work recently on large-scale 3D printing of buildings, building-scale 3D printing. Of course, this is uh, research that's been distributed throughout the country. But what she's done here is with this particular robot, can basically build a complex piece of formwork in less than four minutes. And then, of course, that freezes, and you can then fill it with concrete. Of course, that concrete and the formwork form one unit, because this piece of formwork actually acts as insta insulation to that sort of prefabricated piece. So there's a lot of work, and you can see sort of, and that's just a sampling of the work at the Media Lab. And the Media Lab is a very anti-disciplinary place, right? We're trying to sort of think about how the fusion of different disciplines come together. And so that's, the really, that's the really the approach that we've taken on cities as well. <coughs> In terms of city science, there are six core areas <coughs> of, re <coughs> of research. I'll focus mostly on mobility, but I want to highlight the other ones as well uh, today. The first one is on urban analytics. And uh, this little video here is of the city of San Francisco. Each little red black dot that you see represents a taxi cab with uh, a person in a taxi cab, a drop-off point and a, and, a, and a pickup point. And here, you can start to analyze this data and start to figure out what the patterns of movement are in a city. The blue dots, you'll see in a second, you'll have, you'll have, you can group people together. The people that are represented in, with blue dots are people that go to the same restaurants. The people that are in, in magenta go to the same kinds of bars, right? Of course, this is all anonymous. Right, you don't actually need to track any individual person, but in aggregate, you can determine where people are going, where people live, where people go to, where they visit. And as a transportation planner, you could imagine, with this kind of analysis, where should the bus stop be placed? Where should the next transit station be planned? Should we move certain taxi cab stops because there's no one actually going there? <laughs> um, this kind of sort of data-driven, evidence-based approach towards the design of cities is something that we'd like to, to, uh, to build upon. We're doing some work in incentives and governance. I won't get deep into that other than to say that if we create the right kind of incentives, we can get people to use the right kind of mode of transport, not just to penalize them by taxing them, but to give them the right kind of incentives. And then mobility I'll get into uh, quite uh, uh, for most of the talk. <coughs> in terms of other research, I will highlight later at the very end of the talk some work that we're doing on living and workspace. And this is important because I think that living and workspace and the place, placement of the right kind of workspace in the right location actually affects transportation. In fact, if people are living very far away, then obviously they're going to need to have uh, uh, the right kind of transport. If you have them in the right location, perhaps it's more walkable. So that's something I think is really uh, a, a critical thing. We're doing a lot of work in uh, social networks and electronic networks which I won't get into. And then I'll highlight later sort of energy, uh, energy networks as it relates to transportation, but also the opportunities that electric vehicles provide to building a smart, resilient energy network for cities. So that's sort of the uh, overall background of, uh, of the Media Lab, gives you a sense of where, you know, sort of where we're coming from. What I'd like to do now is to bring you to sort of a global view of what's happening in cities. And many of you probably know all of this. This has to do with the globalization, uh, the, the sort of global trends towards urbanization. 50%, I, I think this is a number that almost everyone knows about, which is basically the, the number of people living in cities. Uh, <coughs> it turns out that the population growth will be concentrated in cities for the, for the next three or four decades or so. Cities will account for 80% of the global CO2 uh, and as well as 75% of global energy use. And in cities specifically, transportation and building operations, running buildings, building buildings, building uh, roads, uh, running uh, uh, vehicles that on those roads accounts for 66% of all energy use. 
in cities. So this is a really dominant part of the economy is what is happening in terms of moving people around. The other thing to think about, and the New York Times came out with an article mm, several months ago, perhaps, uh, on the, uh, the sort of urbanization problem in China. And they're going through ex extreme urbanization, but it is just the beginning. There's an estimate from McKinsey of 300, 300 million rural Chinese are going to be moving to the city in the next 15 years. The Times has rec reported around 250 million. Whatever the number is, this is a huge number. And this is just China alone. Right? The, the US is around 380, 360 million, some, somewhere in between. So what we need to do is provide, what the planet needs to provide is mobility systems for this group of people. And certainly if we, if we apply the US autocentric approach, we're not going to get there. <laughs> and I'll, I'll explain why. So the autocentric approach, uh, which has dominated uh, our, the, our landscape for many years, uh, since, uh, since actually World War II up to, up to this point, is, uh, is sort of the standard approach. And in fact, if you go to China now, or you go to Indi India now, that is the kind of model that has been adopted. And you'll see why in, in a second. <coughs> Firstly, you start thinking about the automobile itself. All right, this is, I'm not picking on BMW, but this is a nice photo to, to, to illustrate this. This is the evolution of the, of the uh, 5 Series uh, since the 1970s, right? So today, the typical automobile weighs around 3,500 3, pounds or so. This is 25 times the weight of the driver, right? Take a bicycle and you think about how much that weighs relative to the driver. Look at the weight gain of the vehicle over this period of time, right? The other thing to think about, of course, is that this car is actually much safer, obviously, since the, since the early, early 70s. It's also more energy efficient, but it, the get, weight gain has, has basically killed all the efficiency that you've, you've gained along the way. In fact, in fact, it's made, made it worse. The same thing applies to refrigerators as well. Our refrigerators are much more energy efficient than they were before, but they were also huge. So any gains have been lost, right? Sort of like going to McDonald's, eating a hamburger, but then having a Diet Coke. You know, it sort of doesn't quite work mathematically. The typical automobile, of course, can go very fast. And this is the picture that you get of all sort of marketing pictures of, of automobiles, right? This great car start uh, driving around on the beach, you know, on, on some windy road. And that's sort of the romantic image of what the automobile is about. The, the reality is that this is how we deal with traffic in cities today. The average speed of the, uh, uh, the top speed of, of any one of these cars is six times that of, of, of the average speed in New York. The average speed in London is 11 miles per hour, Beijing 17 miles per hour, Shanghai, nine miles per hour. I mean, in many cases, you could probably jog faster, right? So top speed is not, <coughs> not the issue in cities. The other thing is range. Vehicles are designed so that you can travel very far. But most trips in the US are very short. Most trips, 80% of the trips are less than 50 miles round trip, 25 or less. And many of them are even less than 25 total, right? This is in the US, which is geographically very large, but heavily urbanized. And this is very true in many other places in the world. So we have basically over-engineered our vehicles. They can do everything, right? They can go from zero to 100 miles per hour. They can go from here all the way to New York City. But that's not what we do. We drive from Cambridge to Brighton. <laughs> that's what we do. Uh, or we drive from, uh, perhaps we drive from Weston to Boston, right? Those, that's sort of the, the, the range in which vehicles are designed, but designed to sort of uh, a sort of compromise position where it does everything and it does nothing at the same time. Of course, we start thinking about the environment, and that's another part of this. This is an analysis looking at internal combustion engine on, on one side and battery electric and the amount of CO2 that each of these propulsion systems provide. The CO2 is three times that of electric vehicles. Now you may ask, well, what if that electric vehicle uses coal unfiltered coal from a power plant. It turns out that the, that vehicle still uses or produces less CO2, about 25% less than conventional internal combustion engine. That doesn't mean that I would promote that, but certainly the ability to take in a, in a very agnostic way different energy sources provides us a kind of uh, flexibility to 
<coughs> to eventually bring in renewable power, which I think is ultimately where you want to go. <coughs> For the planners out there, this is also a very interesting <coughs> slide, is to think about the amount of space that cars consume as well. The typical automobile takes up about 23 times the space of the seat that you occupy uh, today. Right? That's a lot of space. Bicycle is probably two or three times the amount of space that you, you consume. Uh, if you add that up and you start thinking about spaces where you need to park, you probably need a parking space at home, a parking space at work, a parking space, uh, at, uh, you know, sort of a fraction of a parking space at the places you go shop. You add that up and it can add up to about 1,200 square feet, feet per person. 1,200 square feet is exactly the space of my apartment <laughs> for, for one car, right? And if you start thinking about that, that is roughly three times the space of a studio apartment one of these new micro units that uh, Mayor Menino has been pushing for. Uh, that's three times the amount of space just for parking for an automobile. This slide here shows downtown LA and each of the red uh, marked areas is either a surface parking lot or a parking structure or parking garage. You see how much space cars consume in the city. It could be up to a third and I'm not highlighting even street parking. As well, this is down LA. I picked some extreme examples. If you go to Houston, you also have that. Boston is a little bit better, but the amount of space consumed by cars that are generally not used, you know, 95% of the time they're basically waiting for us, uh, and sometimes they're not, they're never moved <laughs> either, uh, <coughs> is a big problem. This is this diagram shows you the amount of 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 uh, time that cars are actually uh, moving uh, in terms of. Uh, of utilization. The utilization typically is around 7%. So just think about that. You spend a lot of money, 30000 40000 50000 $100,000 on, on a vehicle that you use 7% of the time. Right, the rest of the time is sort of sitting, waiting uh, for you. In some congested areas, about 40% of gasoline is used uh, just to look for a parking space. Even though we've spent so much space on parking, we still waste even more fuel looking for a parking space. We've all done it, right? You go to a place, you're not willing to pay for off-street parking, you circle around the block a few times thinking that someone would leave. And that creates, of course, you're not getting to the meeting, you're creating more congestion, you're using more fuel, right? Those are all negative things. This is sort of a, 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 an example of, of the choices we've made. And I think this is, a, this is really the, the, the problem that we want to try to solve. This is a video <coughs> of me and, um, and my uh, uh, co-director in a taxi cab in Beijing. You notice up there, the green sign means that traffic is good, right? It's, it's like a good traffic day. There's good flow uh, in Beijing, right? This, this, is, this is what it is, right? The, you know, the cars are not fully still. So if you go to, you know, India, this is in Bangalore. They have achieved 24-hour congestion. It's an achievement, right? Uh, in here, you actually have other issues, right? You have different vehicle mixes, right? You have buses, cars, auto rickshaws, perhaps oxen and other things, all in the space of the street. And, you know, no lane division, all kinds of things that are happening. So this is an extreme version of what, when you, when you take a kind of auto-centric approach towards the design of cities. This doesn't mean that cars should go away. I think we have new solutions uh, that potentially address that. And then this is the pollution levels uh, are significant. We may not see that here, but when you go to Beijing or Shanghai, this is a, a picture on a clear day out of a hotel that I was staying at in Shanghai. This is, this, and that's not the moon, <laughs> that's the sun. <laughs> and just to give you a sense of the particulate matter levels in Beijing, this, this graph I got from <coughs> Valerie <coughs> Carplus, who is a MIT researcher uh, on <coughs> energy in <coughs> China, excuse me. <coughs> you can see here, this is in January uh, 2013. January, the middle, middle part of January 2013, crazy bad. Crazy bad is actually equivalent to the 2004 Alaska wildfire. And the lower dot here represents a smoking room at the airport. 
You've, you've seen these rooms, right? You never want to go in them, <laughs> right? Well, you just have to step outside and you get that environment. <laughs> and that's on a, on a good day. This is on the lower half of the chart. So this is, this is real life for people that live in this, in many parts of northern China. And in China, they don't have the ownership levels that we have in the US. You know, the car ownership levels in the US are close to 80% or so. Depends on which, which part of the country you're at. Ownership levels in China are, are not even 10, 12% or so. In fact, this is graph here represents the number of new car sales in China. Uh, in fact, they've exploded. Uh, China passed the US in 2010 for total new car sales. And this year, they're approaching around 20 million. US is hovering around 11 million new cars sold every, every year. This is a very interesting graph, too. This is about ownership levels. Ownership levels here, 58 per 1,000 people. The US is around 800. It's actually now 797 or so. Uh, and that dipped primarily, because, thankfully, because of the millennials. A lot of them aren't driving. If we increase China to US levels, you have to multiply that number by 14. And it would be equal to the total China's consumption of, auto, of fuel for those new vehicles that they're buying would equal the total global energy cons uh, production uh, for 2010. What's more interesting is that I've heard from the grapevine that Saudi Arabia expects to not be able to export oil anymore after 2030 because of their own domestic consumption. <laughs> So no place for oil, drinking oil, where are we going to go? <laughs> That's really the reality of the situation. Of course, this has created cities like this, right? We all, and I don't want to get into this, but certainly this kind of sort of low density approach towards city development has been exported throughout the world. Mexico City, you go to the Middle East, to Riyadh, and you go to China, right? In China, of course, the density levels are, um, higher, but they've, they've made a number of mistakes as well. Many of these buildings here are single function. They're either an office tower, either residential building, or industrial use. So in, in effect, they have to, it forces everyone to actually get into a vehicle as well. And the gated communities that are created also does that too. And that kind of model is now rep being replicated in many new cities that you see in China. So how are cities responding to this? You know, it's not like we're just letting it happen. Um, a few things that have happened in terms of policy. Uh, the license plate lottery. This is uh, Beijing put in a license plate lottery a number of years ago that limited the number of new cars. The problem with this is that it actually encouraged people to get into the lottery, right? Because like, if I don't put, go into the lottery, oh, I don't have the chance to buy a car. Well, in, in fact, some people don't need to buy a car, but they put their name into the lottery anyway. <laughs> so. And the exemption to this, of course, is electric vehicles. So if you want an electric vehicle, you can get an electric vehicle right away without going into the lottery. Taxation and other limits. Um, if you go to uh, Hong Kong or Singapore, there's 100% import duty on automobiles. Uh, plus, there is this thing called the COE, Certificate of Entitlement, which is now under an auction system. So there's only so many entitlements per year. And uh, if, you, if you don't outbid someone else, then you know, wait until next year. So these kind of limitations do exist, but they are completely inequitable. <laughs> if you're rich enough, obviously, just outbid any, anyone. Same thing applies to congestion pricing, which is happening in London. Singapore was the first one to deploy these types of systems. Generally, most economists that have looked at congestion pricing agree that they do could reduce congestion and, of course, do fund public transit. But I think there are other sort of side effects of these type of of, of policies. The last area, of course, is to do license plate rationing. Odd number plate, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, even number plate on the other days, right? This doesn't really work either because, again, if you're rich enough, you just buy two cars with different number plates. And what that does is it actually creates more parking. <laughs> so these type of policies aren't always the best metric. What I think you need is actually a combination of policy along with new kinds of solutions. The emergence of vehicle sharing is something to think very, uh, very hard about, which is bicycle sharing programs, <coughs> car sharing programs. Zipcar, for example, really pioneered a lot of this uh, as well. Now you actually see car companies doing car sharing, 
which is an amazing thought <laughs> if you think about it. So you talk to the car companies, and I've talked to them for many years about this. They were actually coming around to this. You talked to car companies about car sharing about five years ago. They, you probably wouldn't even be able to have a meeting. <laughs> Uh, because in, in a way, the car sharing is a very contradictory model to their existing business plan, which is basically sell as many cars as possible. But if you look at the current model of, 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 uh, of uh, car sales, many of the car manufacturers, many of the big OEMs, basically went bankrupt. If you look at GM, they went bankrupt in 2008, primarily because they were based on a commodity product business model. Sell your car, you know, spend bi trillions of dollars to produce automobiles and make a 1% profit <laughs> on it, right? All the metal that goes into that car is processed. And of course, the profit levels are min minimal. Even luxury vehicles, you know, Ferrari, for example, they make about 20% on that car, but they only sell 12 of those per day, <laughs> or they only make 12 of those per day. So it's either through volume or through luxury, but the luxury is extremely low volume. So the business itself, is generally not profitable, <laughs> as evidenced by bankruptcies that you've seen. Now, these new models of transport, which look at sort of new business revenues, new kinds of ownership models, I think is an exciting possibility. It really depends on which car company you talk to. Now, <coughs> of course, this is the American dream uh, from the 1950s. You probably are familiar with it. Uh, it's basically over, at least for, for millennials. <laughs> um, the idea that, uh, I'll read this, since the end of World War II, new cars and suburban homes have powered the world's largest economy and propelled us to our most impressive recoveries. Millennials have lost bo interest in both. And in fact, the economists had put out this article a number of months ago called The Sharing Economy, which is all about con collaborative consumption. Right, that you don't necessarily need to own a home, you can always rent a home, and a lot of people are underwater with their mortgages <laughs> uh, they can't actually get out of uh, and, and move to a place where they might actually get a job. <coughs> ownership of music, ownership of even a dog. You could just rent a dog you know, for the days that you need. Um, the music, uh, lawnmower, all that stuff, all these material things, you, not, you, you don't need, actually need to own, you could have access to. And this is a completely different approach. I don't know how many people use Airbnb or heard of it. Right? That's an extremely successful uh, new program to basically rent out space in your home when you're not there. Right? So all this extra inventory we're sort of getting rid of or at least making profit on. So that's wh where the sharing economy is coming. And this is really the beginnings of a new model for transportation. From my, our point of view, we also think about how this new model of transport fits within sort of the vision of what cities are. <coughs> and so we have a vision of sort of a city composed of micro cities, very small, sort of walkable neighborhoods that are perhaps no more than 15 minutes of walking in terms of its total radius, where everything you need, or most of the things you need, are within that sort of zone. And there are a number of very good examples of, of neighborhoods that have this character. This is a, uh, the, uh, basically each of these little circles represents stops along the red line, right? And you know that most of the urban density is clustered around these metro stations. And a lot of the things that you need are within this 20 minute walk. Of course, some squares along the way are much nicer than others. But if you take that and go back to an old European city like Paris, medieval Paris actually consisted of a series of villages. They weren't connected by mass transit. That came much later. It was sort of a retrofit. But this 20 minute walk, it's, uh, there's something fundamental about that. And if you start thinking about the growth of the city <coughs> over time, this 20 minute walk, walk, walking radius became a kind of pattern that started to emerge. And you see this a lot in many other European cities. And we started to do a scan of the number of services that are distributed within that 20 minute walking distance. So in Paris, obviously, you step outside your door and there are probably 20 cafes within one minute of walking, right? Which means that the distribution of services is a critical aspect of how you design a city. The distribution of shops, distribution of physicians, distribution of pharmacies. There's actually one city in the world where all the pharmacies are in one place. So everyone has to go there <laughs> uh, to, to, to get their, you know, you know, their Delsum or whatever they need uh, uh, to get. Um, 
So for us, this micro city <coughs> should be basically 80% of what you need within that space uh, for uh, within a kind of 10 minute walking distance. When you have that kind of clustering, you can then begin to create uh, to create new systems that are much more scalable and also much more economical in terms of the resource consumption. So you can have things like community heating and cooling or district heating and cooling. You can bring in a microgrid, which I'll talk about later, which provides you a kind of resilient energy layer in cities. You can think about wastewater uh, treatment in a completely different way. And you can, of course, integrate vehicle sharing systems in the same sort of module. You can start thinking about a city almost like a viral network. This is sort of the computer science side of the Media Lab sort of influencing us to think about cities as a, almost like a mesh network, where each of these are sort of semi-autonomous, and they are connected with mass transit. But then you have other nodes within those, those nodes that provide you the kind of resiliency that you want. The concept that we've been promoting <coughs> for many years <coughs> is this idea of on-demand transportation. We coined the term more than seven or eight years ago, and now it's sort of adopted. Uh, throughout the kind of transportation world, which is to think about alternatives to the private automobile. And this little slide coming up is kind of an ecosystem approach towards on-demand transportation. We want to privilege walking, and that has to do with the design of the micro city. If we can get most people to walk or bike, we can, of course, dramatically reduce the amount of consumption uh, of these kind of resources. The second thing we want to provide is shared transportation services. So these black red boxes are vehicles that our group has designed specifically for shared transportation. And the one I'll highlight today mostly is the city car. But we've also designed <coughs> electric bicycles, electric scooters, electric three-wheelers, which is actually a new project. So this whole ecosystem should be a kind of multimodal approach, which allows you to select the vehicle that you need for the task that you need. Right, so if I'm going to the grocery store, well, and it's a nice day out, maybe I should just walk or, or take the subway or ride a bicycle. But when I come home, I want to take a car, which I, of course, can carry my groceries. So this kind of asymmetric trip capability is something that we want to be able to have. The other thing you could do with on-demand transportation, of course, is combine different modes. Right? I can take one of these on-demand uh, vehicles uh, to a, a train station, try to solve that sort of first mile problem which may be that the train station may be too far away to walk. Take the train or the subway to another part of the city and then take a car for some part of that trip and be able to combine these things. And the ability to harmonize amongst each of these systems is actually the next, the, sort of the next part of the research. So I'll just highlight a number of vehicles that we've designed. This is a, a, a motor scooter that we've designed <coughs> called a robo scooter. And a robo scooter, uh, <coughs> Uh, uses uh, in-wheel electric motors. Uh, and in-wheel electric motor is a kind of new drive train system that you can imagine, right? Traditional car has an internal combustion engine, which requires a drive line, suspension systems, uh, uh, differentials, all these, all these elements that a car needs in order to make the wheels move. In this case, we said, forget about all that. Let's just put a motor in the wheel, electric motor in the wheel, and power it, <laughs> right? Now, of course, the first in-wheel electric motor was developed by Daimler, uh, sorry, uh, Fernand Porsche uh, in 1895 or so. He was creating a steam engine vehicle with electric motors in each wheel. This is the first hybrid vehicle over 120 years ago. So the idea of electric motors in wheels is not a new idea. It's been around for a while. It faded, of course, as internal combustion sort of took over uh, in the 19 late 1920s. And what we've done is put that in the wheel. It allows us to design a vehicle completely differently than before, right? <coughs> we don't have a drive line. We can design the body completely differently. We can control the wheel directly at the wheel. We can add suspension. We can add braking all within that wheel. We've also developed an electric bicycle that has an in-wheel motor as well. What this does is it provides electrical assist. Many of you probably have seen these pedal electric bikes. This is the same idea. The only difference is that we've integrated the battery and the motor together into one unit, which allows you to retrofit the bike very easily. We've also designed <coughs> a three-wheeler. This three-wheeler is called the persuasive electric vehicle. The whole idea is to persuade you to not drive an SUV and to get into a bicycle lane. <laughs> I mean, that's, the, that's the whole concept. And of course, these are big issues, right? 
These issues are, be, uh, are, 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 are not just here in the U.S., but parts of the Middle East. There are the, the rate of diabetes in uh, China has actually increased as they become much more wealthy. So, of course, the bicycle now in China is considered to be for poor people. It's not hip to be riding a bike. Everyone wants to get into the car, but as you drive in that lane that you saw, everyone's sort of stuck in traffic. Everyone in, in the bike is actually moving quite fast. But the pollution levels are so bad that people, there's such an aspiration to own an automobile there that they'd rather wait in traffic than to move anywhere they want to go. And it's, this is compounded by the fact that the pollution levels are not good, so why would you want to ride a bike? At least in a car, you have condi air conditioning, right? So with this type of vehicle, we have designed basically a bike lane vehicle. Each of the wheels can actually lean, and there is an electric motor in the back. You have to pedal to use the bike. It has a canopy <coughs> for uh, protection from some of the elements. Uh, and so this is really for people that don't bike, right? Because the people that bike already will bike. You know who they are, right? Those guys will bike. But the rest of us, perhaps a single mom, perhaps someone in a business suit, perhaps my grandmother, might not ride a bike. So let's design a vehicle for those folks. And I'll show you a little video of what that looks like. In fact, we think that uh, part of the biking experience should be social. If you can make biking social, meaning that you know, Walter and I can go bike together, well, it's more likely that we actually do it as opposed to doing it alone. You, actually, you and I might feel safer because we're biking together. There's more sort of safety in numbers. So the whole idea of social biking is also another aspect of, of the vehicle design. The city car is a vehicle that we've designed uh, for over a number of years. <coughs> and it's basically a two-passenger electric vehicle that's designed for shared use. It's also foldable, because I talked about the parking issue earlier, so that we can save on space. And it's a, it's a completely modular vehicle. It's bu built on in-wheel motors, as I mentioned before. But what we have here is we've integrated all of the major elements that you may see in a wheel, including the suspension system, the braking system, the steering system, the drive system. And what we're calling this is a wheel robot. You know, this sort of intelligent uh, being, which is in this case the wheel, plus the motor, all in one package. And you replicate this robotic wheel on all four corners of the vehicle. And you control each wheel electronically as if it was an airplane. Airplanes have by-wire control. Right, so you don't have mechanical linkages to control the, you know, the aerions of an airplane. Uh, you have electronic control and you have redundancy behind it. You can apply that to uh, air, uh, automobiles as well. In fact, there are by-wire controls in existing cars today. There's by-wire throttle. There's not so much by-wire steering yet. That's, that's sort of a new thing. Uh, and then by-wire braking, that all exists. So what we've, what we've done is said, let's just make the entire thing by-wire. Because what that does is it allows us to lower the weight of the vehicle. We don't have as much mechanical hardware. And we can look at novel controls. <coughs> the other benefit of having this kind of module is that we can integrate one unit so that we can manufacture it as, as sort of an optimized piece, which then looks at sort of a newly distributed manufacturing kind of process for, for vehicles. This is a video of the car. You'll see here that each wheel has independent control. We can turn each wheel inward so that the vehicle can turn on itself. It has zero turn radius. So forget about K-turns, parallel parking the way you normally drive, uh, you know, all that stuff. It's very easy to get licensed for this vehicle. No more reverse. You don't need to reverse anymore. And then the whole thing folds up. It takes up very little space. The door opens up through the front. You can park the vehicle perpendicular to the sidewalk, step out directly onto the curb which is much safer than parking, opening up a door, especially for bicyclists. And then you'll see it drive off. We can fit three cars in one parking space. Of course, there's some laws that prevent you from driving uh, head into a space. So we have to work on some policy uh, issues. This is a comparison, a weight size comparison of that to a smart. The, the car in the end is a little bit longer than a smart when it's in the down position. When it's folded, it's the width of a parking space. And you can see here the parking ratio that you get, three to one. This actually gets very interesting for an off-street parking space. Off-street parking spaces look like this. And most of the space is actually dedicated to the aisle. 
because you need to get one car out. But if you move to shared mobility and very compact foldable cars, you could increase your parking ratio by five to one. If you talk to any land developer, that's huge, right? I just recently found out that the cost of a parking space at MIT, an underground parking space, anyone guess how much that costs to construct? More, about 150 per space. That's huge. I mean, it's really expensive. I mean, that's much more than probably the car that you're going to buy and put it in there. So that, that amount of, of, of cost is huge. Of course, the car companies don't deal with that cost. It's someone else's cost, right? But if you think about the entire system, these are the benefits that you can potentially have. We started to think about how this would fit in various cities in the world, right? This is in Hong Kong where I said it's you know, quite expensive to own a car. You can imagine what happens if you start to place these pickup and pickup points for charging of vehicles. What happens here is that now this becomes a mobility hub, right? This is like a transit station almost, or a bus stop. But this bus stop is dynamic. You can put it anywhere because all you need access to is electricity. And in most modern cities, you can get electricity almost everywhere. What this does it be is it becomes an agent for the city, right? If you want to solve transportation issues in a particular part of the city, you can plug this in. After a certain time period, you'd be able to determine whether or not there's actually use of that resource at that point. If there's enough demand, perhaps you need to expand it or move it to somewhere else. You can imagine these are very adaptable. And in a place like Singapore, this becomes an extension of public transit, right? It, you basically place this at every major transit stop and you allow people to kind of combine modes with this. Of course, pricing has to be done right in order for this to work. If you don't do the pricing right, obviously someone can take a car and go all the way uh, to where they want to go. You want to be able to create a kind of complementary system between the two. And then we've done some work in Europe, too, to think about how this would fit there. We started to do a lot of work with General Motors up to that point, until their bankruptcy in 2008. <laughs> so we couldn't ask them for more money at that point. And <coughs> so what, we d what I did was I spent about a year looking for another sponsor. And in 2009, we found one in Spain. So I'm going to show you the development of this vehicle from that point forward. Uh, if you're familiar with Spain, um, at the very top here, this is uh, Bilbao, San Sebastian, uh, Basque Air region of, of Spain, very close to the French border. There's a pretty big automotive industry sector, mostly of parts suppliers in that region of Spain. And the Basque government at the time, and this is around 2009 before the economic crisis, said, let's start to invest in a new EV economy, electric vehicle economy. And so they invested in this project. We worked with a Formula 2 team. Here's, here's me and the rest of the team. So, some of these guys are actually the, the, the Spanish uh, contingent. And we, de we spent about two years developing this prototype from that little model that I showed you earlier to this full-scale working prototype. And you'll see the number of development models. Uh, this is the original wheel robot. Here is the newly designed one. This is a small-scale uh, version of the, the car. Uh, this is the one that, if you come to MIT, you'll see this guy. You won't see this guy, <laughs> which is a, over in Spain. Uh, and we built these foam models to get a sense of the overall proportion of the vehicle, the styling. Uh, everything around it. The vehicle is extremely modular, as I mentioned before. This list down below are the companies that are building each separate module of the vehicle. There would be one company responsible for the entire wheel assembly, another company for the body, another company for, for the um, battery system, and so forth. This is a comparison of our car to the, uh, <coughs> the Smart and also the Fiat 500. <coughs> and you'll see here sort of the, the guts of the vehicle. This is the, <coughs> the main <coughs> body. <coughs> Excuse me. And we finally unveiled the whole project in Brussels uh, in January of 2012. Uh, this is the unveiling of it. Uh, the Spanish group that we were working with was fairly well connected. This is the president of the e European Union. He came to the unveiling. This is what the final prototype looks like. I have to tell you, though, that this was a student project. You know, you never get to this. I mean, in any student project, generally. Uh, and it was sort of unbelievable for, from our, my point of view that we were able to even get to this point, given the economy, given the, the death of my advisor also, which is also a big problem. Uh, but we were able to get to this because we actually believed in it. Uh, and we've put in a lot of sort of um, 
we just put in the, the time necessary to get to this point. This is an interior shot of the vehicle. One thing to notice here is that the steering wheel is mounted to the center console, which allows you to move it from left hand to right hand. So you don't need to have a separate manufacturing line for left hand drive or right hand drive. Here is a happy sponsor. Uh, there's myself, uh, along with Will. Will is uh, the principal designer uh, of, the pro of the car. Here's a shot of the interior. This is uh, the, the team that worked on it, part of the team that worked on it. And then this is the test drive of the vehicle. This is driving around the streets of Victoria, which is the capital of the Basque area. And you'll see here that we were able to keep the core elements of the vehicle. By wire control, robotic wheel, foldability, front entry and exit. Those are the four things that we were able to keep in the vehicle. This is now being crash tested for European roads. <coughs> and if they pass crash tests, then of course it could be deployed. A number of cities have expressed interest in doing a pilot program. In fact, the city, Berlin, city of Berlin, uh, which has a very good uh, car sharing program already, uh, uh, has committed to uh, deploying some 500 of these on it for an on-demand system as soon as these are ready. <coughs> The next step, of course, is where does autonomy play into this? So when we designed that vehicle, we had in mind that autonomous technologies would potentially b have a role in how cities and how people get around. And so all I'll talk about now is what that effect is. Uh, many of you probably know this car. This is the Google car. The, car, the Google car costs over $150,000. Uh, that's minus the car. The car is another 30 on top of that. And you should ask yourself, if you had $200,000, would you have a, a Prius that drove itself, or would you buy a, a Ferrari <laughs> and drive it yourself, right? These are sort of, the cost issues are still being addressed currently. But the benefit of an autonomous vehicle is, some of it is obvious, obviously a car can drive itself, it's obviously going to be safer because cars can start to communicate with each other. People do crazy things in cars, right? We start to, we sleep, we drink, we smoke, we text, we do all kinds of things that humans do. Humans are actually very bad drivers. Professionals, amateurs, men, women, old, young, we're all bad. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a chart of why uh, that in a second. With autonomous vehicles, you can begin to have cars follow each other very closely. You can improve traffic flow by about 20 to 30%. There's a few studies that, that have looked at this. And you have the potential to lower the weight of the vehicle. That is if we can get to full ubiquity of autonomous vehicles. If every vehicle was autonomous, we won't have any accidents, so therefore we can lower our, our weight of the vehicle to a very minimal amount. The reason why our cars are very heavy today is because of the safety, safety systems that we have on board in case we crash. But if we don't have a crash sort of uh, regime, uh, then it's uh, not necessary. This is a chart of the number of deaths in the US. Uh, based on 2010 data. So you can see about one third is based on sleeping. Alcoholism is really not good either. Drug use, texting. Autonomous vehicles don't do any of those things. They also follow the rules as well. <laughs> you know, we, we decide what to do you know, when we're driving. So with this, this is uh, 32,000 deaths. That's actually reduced over the years. We've, we've reduced the number of automotive deaths in the US, uh, primarily because our road conditions are, are pretty good. People are following the rules generally. But this kind of human error still exists. And there's about 1.25 million people per year that die globally from car accidents. And most of those are human error, not because the vehicle is poorly designed, not because of the weather, not because of uh, poor design of the road. It's really human error that causes that. So, of course, autonomy can address some of those issues. This is the MIT vehicle, uh, autonomous vehicle, driving through Harvard Square. And this is a picture of the LiDAR system from that vehicle. And you can see through Harvard Square, you can actually pick up people right, through this. Now, this is the onboard sensing of the vehicle. right? So what this does is it provides a picture of the immediate area around the vehicle. What gets interesting is if you can exchange information between you and another car that has its own image as well. So you can create a picture of the entire city based on LiDAR of 
each autonomous vehicle. That gives you a much better picture than you just sort of staring out into space while you're driving. The other thing that you can imagine is that some cities have very good traffic cameras and traffic weight sensors and all kinds of sensors at the intersection. As these cars begin to communicate to the city infrastructure, that also is another layer where you're reducing the cost of sensing by looking at off-board sensing. If I'm able to communicate to a traffic signal and the, or a traffic uh, uh, camera, and it can see that there's no car coming that way, why should I ever stop? Perhaps there should be no intersection. Perhaps I shouldn't slow down at all. Because every time I stop, I waste energy and I have to build up speed again. <laughs> also, with autonomous vehicles, you, I don't know if you ever noticed, but light turns green, we don't all go. <laughs> it's not like a Formula One race where everyone hits the gas. It doesn't work that way. There's also this lag. That lag contributes to the problem. With this kind of synchronization of technology, we could improve traffic flow uh, tremendously. This is an, um, uh, a proposition for an autonomous intersection for my colleagues uh, at, at, uh, in the Aero Aster Department. So with this, we have no, you know, no traffic signals, uh, no, no, tr no, no street, uh, street signs. All that stuff goes away. Can you imagine an intersection like this? <laughs> Well, that's actually how we walk, right? People walk this way. You could ever watch the marching bands? They do this uh, as well, but they practice. Um, so this is potentially what the future could be like. Anyway, just think about that for a bit. We've also looked at the interaction between autonomous vehicles and pedestrians. Today, when we cross the street, we actually look at the driver you know, if we, if we're, especially if we're jaywalking, um, we do that. <coughs> the drivers have certain signals that they can give you, right? The horn, the light, hand gestures, whatever it may be, right? There's ways of expressing to you eminent danger. But with an autonomous vehicle, how do you communicate with a vehicle that the driver is perhaps sitting in the driver's seat, but not driving? They're texting, they're eating dinner, they're putting lipstick on, whatever they're doing. How do you then uh, uh, interact with an autonomous vehicle or a robotic being? And that's really the question of the research. So in this case, we developed <coughs> a prototype called Avita, which is a testing array. And in this case, <coughs> blood it plate. Sorry, I have to take another cough drop. Um, in this case, what we've done is we've developed an array. I'll play it again where we have a lot of anthropomorphic elements to the vehicle. The lights follow you, almost like Terminator, right? So as you cross the street, you, you actually have some recognition of the, of, of the presence of the vehicle. That's what's do, what, what he's doing there. As he put his hand closer to the vehicle, these set of LED lights activate as you get closer to the vehicle. And <coughs> on the very top <coughs> is a directional speaker. <coughs> the directional <coughs> Excuse me. The directional speaker then says something very polite and civilized and says, you may now cross the street. Right? Um, this is a testing array. And obviously, we have to develop the right kind of language, visual and audio language, of communication between pedestrians and bicyclists to autonomous vehicles and back and forth. This is a sort of new piece of research that just doesn't exist yet. Most of the people that are working on autonomous vehicles are working on sensors, lowering the cost of sensors, working on the algorithms for routing them on a highway, uh, and, uh, and um, reducing the overall cost of these systems. They're not thinking about what happens when that car starts to engage cities where there are people, bicycles, little boys you know, playing soccer on the street, stick ball, all that stuff in a city. That's really the next sort of step. And we think that if you don't solve this, you're never going to get there. We'll just have our auto-centric sort of society. What I see as the future of mobility is the kind of combination of three major areas. The first is vehicle electrification, which I talked a lot about. It's really to try to get to a agnostic type of powertrain system that uses the most amount of available renewable power. That's one, one piece. And there's lots of advantages for electrification of vehicles. <coughs> the second one is new models of use. 
vehicle sharing, all the different types of vehicle sharing, whether it's a kind of Uber style vehicle sharing, relay rides, Zipcar, Hubway, those models are st starting to evolve and become very popular. And then the autonomy, which is, of course, the intelligence behind it. There is some synergies that you can imagine between each of these. The first one is that if you look at electric vehicles and vehicle sharing, you have an efficient design and you have high utilization. You're utilizing that resource tremendously. And of course, if you utilize a resource that's very wasteful, that's not as good as something that's more efficient. Native integration between electric vehicles and autonomy. Of course, you have better safety, but the integration of, elect of autonomous technology to a conventional vehicle is more expensive, primarily because a conventional vehicle does not have a bi-wire system. In it. You have to put in actuators to control the throttle, to control the brake, to control the steering wheel. That costs more money. With native integration of electric vehicles, particularly ones that are bi-wire, you l eliminate that entire layer, make it much more easier to integrate. And the third one is vehicle sharing with autonomy. The biggest problem with vehicle sharing, and if anyone's ever used the Hubway bike program, is that sometimes there's no bikes <laughs> available. Or you might come to a station and there's no parking available. So the distribution of parking spaces as well as vehicles themselves is handled primarily through bike through trucks, right? You see all these trucks moving uh, hubway bikes all the time. This is very costly. It's uh, manual labor, and you're managing the problem with another management problem, which is to tell, where these, tell these guys where to move bikes all day. Move, move 15 bikes from South Station, put it over here to Park Street. <laughs> After you're done with that, pick up five bikes from Beacon Hill and bring it over to MGH. You know, you have to con constantly sort of tell these guys what to do. And uh, that's not effective because you never can meet the demand with that. And what you're doing is moving empty bikes around. What you could do with autonomous vehicles is have them redistribute themselves. But the current laws don't allow that. Because the current law says you have to have a safety driver, right? which requires a human being to sit in the car even though they're not driving. So this is a policy question that comes up is, can we leverage the opportunity to use autonomous vehicles to solve this problem so that then we can move to a much more efficient sort of mo uh, model of, of, of sustainable transport. I'll give you an example of, of the power of this. This is Singapore. And uh, how many people have been to Singapore? As you know, Singapore is an island nation. It's got a population of 5.4 million people. It's very small, 30 miles by 16, very small but you have a lot of people, almost the size of the, the population of Massachusetts, all within that one little area. Car ownership is about 12% in Singapore. Most people take public transit because it, it's a world-class tra public transit system. Uh, they have congestion pricing there. Import duty, 100% auction-based COE. Private cars total 800,000. The study by my colleagues have looked at what happens if you take a fraction of those 800,000 vehicles and made them shared and autonomous. From their calculations, they estimate that all you need is 300,000 vehicles, shared, this thing, S here, uh, shared vehicles to provide mobility for everyone with the maximum of 15 minutes of wait during peak hour, which is a, it's a kind of mind-blowing figure because if you're a public transit advocate, it's like, well, I, I don't have a job anymore. If I'm a private car owner, I don't have a car anymore, but I can get anywhere within 15 minutes. And I only need 40% of the total cars that already exist. So we can get rid of half a million cars and move everybody no more than 15 minutes. Are we willing to go there? That's the question. So we have, the solutions exist. We just are, you know, whether, whether we want to go there or not. And even with the cost, of $200,000 per vehicle, would this still be less than the total cost of transit for everybody? These are some of the questions we, we keep asking. In terms of energy, resilient energy, you can start thinking about how electric vehicles start to play a role within the greater energy networks that we see in cities. This is a picture of Manhattan uh, right after Sandy. 
You see, not very resilient. This is a battery park. And the reason why they have power there is because it's, it's reclaimed land. And of course, they have their own backup power in that area because it was a new part of the city. <coughs> With electric vehicles, you can begin to imagine the possibility of using the extra storage capability of those vehicles to provide emergency power to a city during situations like this. Right. As these vehicles are plugged in, you can, of course, discharge the, the battery during a sort of peak condition. The other thing you can do, too, is that when you have this amount of extra capacity, you can also use that power to do peak shaving. When you have a city uh, where perhaps all the air conditioning units are running at the same time because it's a very hot day out in the mid middle part of the day, and you're running near capacity in terms of electricity consumption, you can utilize the power of those batteries. Of course, you probably need a couple, uh, you know, probably 30,000 cars to do it. But 30,000 cars is actually a small fraction of the total cars that you see uh, in cities today. Second thing that you can imagine, too, is that we've created the potential to tap into renewable power sources. Right? The renewable power sources, in this case, will be supplemental to the grid. But at some point, we can switch that equation. And the reason why I think that's possible is because eventually, that battery will not be useful anymore in that car. That battery, after several years, maybe three years of driving, will drop its state of charge to about 80%. And that's the state of charge in which the auto industry has decided that it's time to replace the battery. But that battery is still good. That battery is also very expensive, too. That battery probably costs ten thousand dollars, right? So with these EV, EV batteries, you can imagine the second life use of that battery as a stationary storage device in a building, perhaps as a, as part of a charging network, where you create a reservoir for energy from renewable sources as well as from the grid down below, so that you have a very quick charging scheme available to you so that when an electric vehicle comes to be charged, you can discharge power back into that vehicle immediately rather than disrupting the grid because now you have this new sort of buffer. That also, what that also does is it lowers the cost of ownership, whether it's a vehicle private owner or whether it's a fleet operator because now you have a usable battery for more than just the life of the vehicle. You can actually earn money off of this as well. So that lowers, or am lowers the amortization cost for upfront ownership as well as it gives it a second life. And this is the power potentially of electric vehicles is that they're not only providing mobility, they're providing energy storage, which is actually the problem for renewable power today. I want to highlight uh, a book uh, written by Bill Mitchell, my late advisor. Uh, we have copies of it here if you want to uh, get one. Um, he finished this book before he passed away in 2010. <coughs> it's called Reinventing the Automobile. It basically talks about four things. The first one is that the DNA of the automobile needs to change. We need to shift from internal combustion to other alternative fuel uh, types. In this case, electric is, is the one that he's promoting. The second piece of this book talks about the emergence of the mobility internet, which is basically vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and all the protocols between vehicles that they can start to talk to each other, talk to infrastructure, uh, talk to pedestrians, and so forth. That's another kind of critical piece. The third piece is the mobile, uh, sorry, the energy internet, which is how do we sort of restructure our, our cities so that we can provide electricity to these new kind of systems. That has to do with the smart grid and vehicle, char vehicle to grid charging, all, the, all that sort of research that's going on. And then the fourth piece, which is probably the most pertinent to this crowd, is <coughs> how do we develop new models for mobility, new models of mobility for cities, specifically on-demand systems. Uh, and so this book uh, summarizes that, and if you want to read that, it's a, it's a great thing to read. I'll highlight now a little bit of research that's happening outside of the mobility space, but I don't want to talk about it too long, primarily because uh, Kent Larson, who is, uh, who, uh, who is my colleague at the Media Lab, will be giving a talk about all this other research here, I think, on March 6th. Uh, you can confirm the date. Uh, we are doing a little bit of work <coughs> separately from, from mobility on, on housing, as I mentioned earlier. Space on demand is something that we've developed. 
And this is a little video showing you a micro apartment that actually is transformable. In this case, all the walls can move. You can have a working space. You can have uh, 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 sleepovers. Uh, you can have um, a party space. Uh, all transformable uh, through actuating uh, the walls of this space. In fact, you can even have a dance party uh, at the very end. So this very small micro unit, perhaps a one bedroom or less, is designed specifically for young professionals that are priced out of the market. They have to live in Reading or something, and they really want to live you know, in the innovation district, perhaps. So with this design, we have been able to actually move it beyond this video, and we've developed an actual wall system that can do this. This is a wall system that has a series of electric motors in, in the bottom, and then all you have to do is actuate this with your, your finger, like that. <coughs> At the very top, you'll see um, a uh, wireless charging scheme, so you don't actually have to have a wire in the wall. All the entire wall system itself has sensors as well, so you, you can avoid objects. And then this system is a pin that basically locks it in place. So if you're in a seismic situation, it won't topple over and kill you. Uh, we're also doing some work on food. Food is important in cities too. In fact, most food is wasted. About one third of all food is wasted, uh, in the mostly in the distribution. So something that's grown, and as it gets to you, it's, it's probably picked too early. That's the first thing. And it doesn't have the nutrient level that it needs. The second thing is that it just gets destroyed along the way uh, because of freshness. So we've developed a new technology to develop essentially soilless uh, farming, which uses 99% less water. This is a system developed by NASA about 12 years ago called aeroponics. And in this case, there's a misting chamber below that sprays water and nutrients to the root of the plant. And you can get about four times the productivity and also much less time, about three times the amount of time. So we have a little growth chamber that we've built in the Media Lab. And this growth chamber, is very small sort of walk-in closet sized space. And you'll see here a little video of what that system looks like. Underneath this, as this opens up, is a series of pipes. And those pipes have spray nozzles. And every so often, it will spray this nutrient mist uh, to the root of the plant. What we did uh, for this project is we grew uh, enough fruits, no, sorry, enough vegetables for one salad for the entire media lab in five weeks out of that little room. And the entire media lab is about 300 people. So this is, this is the harvest. The harvest is basically taken out of that room. Right? You don't really need to wash this very much because there's no soil. There's no pesticides. Uh, and I think it tastes better. When, when you, you, next time you come to the media lab, we'll invite you to one of the next harvest for this. Uh, and ultimately, what we want to do is be able to integrate this kind of new farming system into the facades of buildings rather than rooftops. Right? You think about all the surface area that buildings have, especially on blank facades of buildings. Could you integrate a food productive layer, which may be only two meters thick, that is appended to the side of a building? And with this kind of harvesting, this is local production, li literally local production. And imagine if you had a conference room with a gro growth chamber of tomatoes. I mean, just think about the aesthetic differences that you will have than what we have today. Eventually, we, we think that you can actually produce enough food to supply you know, at least the fruit and vegetable needs for a majority of the city. We've done some estimates of this, and it turns out that you can, with a kind of one square meter area, you can feed, feed one person if, if it's all stacked. We have to, of course, prove this. That's the next step, is to go through that growth chamber and, and be able to record the data behind it. The last thing I'll show you today is our CityScope project, which is basically a simulator. Uh, it's an urban observatory. It's a, it's a, it's a decision support system using, of all things, Legos. <laughs> um, and it was inspired by the Avatar movie. You're probably familiar with this hollow table. The hollow table is basically a, a table that allows people to gather around and make decisions about how to kill al aliens, right? In this case, what we want to do is create a, a table where everyone can get up, get, gather around and make urban decisions. That's really uh, the goal of, of CityScope. And it's based on the concept of, of using Lego bricks, right? So this is the smallest Lego brick that you can get. 
And you can imagine assigning this some properties. All right, it has, it has dimensions, obviously, but it also has other properties that you can uh, attach to it. So you can imagine that perhaps that a yellow brick is equal to a Starbucks. Starbucks has so many employees, it has so many people that go through it every day, right? Uh, or perhaps a black brick represents housing. Height of the building, dimensions, single loaded corridor, et cetera. You can build a city like that. In fact, I asked our students to build Kendall Square out of Lego bricks. You can see this is them building, building the model. They had a lot of fun doing it. It's very collaborative, too. And Legos are very friendly, generally. So with that, you could imagine a system where you build the city out of Lego bricks, a scale model. You take that model and you scan it three-dimensionally to get all the 3D data. With the 3D data, you bring it into the computational world to run the kind of simulations that we like to look at in terms of traffic flow, energy consumption, uh, urban food productivity, wind and solar access, and so forth. And then take that information and project it back onto a new model, which is what I'm going to show you now. So this is a model that we built of Kendall Square. And you can see here, <coughs> you see the movement of, vehicle, of people here. Uh, we moved a, 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 a building from one side to the next. We're able to also simulate uh, energy flows in that space. This is uh, highlighting uh, proposed new buildings within the zone. Um, what this does essentially is create a kind of test platform to simulate the complexities of the city. And imagine if you can make it fully parametric, where I want to make a street wider. I want to see what happens to that street when I make it wider? Do I, put, do I now have enough room to put a bicycle lane? Can I make a street narrower as well? Perhaps I'd occupy that with parklets or with uh, hubway bike stations. Uh, how is that going to affect the overall, station, uh, overall, via, uh, overall traffic flow? You'll see, as I've been showing this video, we've been doing a lot of 3D mapping, which allows you to project imagery on every surface of the model. And by doing that, you can imagine having the actual facades of the buildings sort of texturized on the physical model. Eventually, what you could do is then say, well, if I placed the world's tallest building in the middle of Kendall Square, I would be able to look at the impact immediately in real time with such a simulation tool. And what this does is it replaces models like this. This is the Shanghai model, right? It's bigger than this room. You can see the scale of the people back there. This model, of course, has cost millions of dollars. <coughs> and as soon as it's built, it's out of date. This is a Chicago model. This is uh, you know, the hub. And uh, this is the Singapore model. All of these models are generally out of date when they're built, very expensive to upkeep, and they're only for presentation. But just imagine if you took every city in the world and gave them this interactive tool that represents what's actually happening in a static and dynamic way. That's really our goal for this project. You can see here the kind of list of things. This is just the beginning list of the things that you can be, begin to understand uh, in these type of models. Our goal, of course, is eventually to build an open platform which can be replicated at many cities uh, throughout the world. We want to share data, and we also want to share best practices in terms of simulation models. I want to end there, but if there's any questions, please uh, thank you very much uh, for, for dealing with my cough. Thank you. <laughs>